So I'm going to tell you about the best thing that I ever built. And you are going to wonder why I am telling you about this. Uh, and I promise it will turn out to be relevant. So the best thing that I ever built, I cast your mind back to the summer of 1999. Um, I was the house manager for my living group in college, the Women's Independent Living Group at MIT. And uh, basically what that meant was I was in charge of wiring things or fixing things or building simple like shelves or, uh, or unclogging drains. Basically, we were kind of cheapskates and, um, uh, and also we legitimately did not have very much money. Um, so anytime that I, being medium handy, could keep the professionals away from the house, uh, that was my job to do. Um, so what this meant was I had access to a lot of tools, um, and we also had a lot of machine parts lying around, uh, including a couple of old engines and some saw blades that were kind of rusty and maybe not good for sawing anymore. And hence was born the Destructinator, which <laughs> was seven wheels of spinning death. Uh, no safety guards. Uh, we were dropping apples in there. We dropped a bunch of goldfish crackers in there, which turns into cheddar sawdust in like three seconds. Um, we dropped in a half a watermelon. We kind of invented Fruit Ninja that day. Um, <laughs> but uh, but it, it wasn't a video game. Um, it was not even augmented reality. It was reality reality. It, like, like, if you were in the front row, you got juice in your face. And, um, and that's the best thing I ever built. And what I want to talk to you about today is why most startups fail. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll come back to the Destructinator, I promise. So, uh, so, so uh, thank God. Uh, most startups fail. Uh, in fact, 80% of them do. 80%. And there are a lot of reasons. There are a lot of problems that startups can run into. But the number one problem is not that the technology doesn't end up working. The number one problem isn't actually that you recruit the wrong team. The number one problem isn't even that you get outcompeted by somebody else who's working on something similar. The number one reason why startups fail is because they pick a bad problem. They don't go after something with a large enough market opportunity. And the, uh, the OECD did a study. They asked Americans, would you rather take a risk, start a business of your own, or work for someone else. And more than half of all Americans said, yes, yes, I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to start that business of my own. But when they looked at people's actual behavior, only 4% of people do. And when you hear that when those 4% of people do, 80% of the time, it doesn't go the way they wanted, you start to understand. And yet, there has never been a better time in America to start a new company. 27% of all job creation in this country comes from startups, comes from companies that are younger than, than 10 years old. Um, the infrastructure for a startup has never been richer. So um, there are things called incubators and accelerators. Uh, I run one, which I'll get back to in a minute. Uh, a third of all Series A financing goes into companies that go through incubator accelerator programs. These are entities that are specifically constructed to give you resources, give you office space, give you accounting services, uh, give you mentorship, sometimes set you up with funding sources, get you off on the right foot so that your startup, that your company has the best possible chance of success. And their whole company, like WeWork, is revolutionizing the way that people approach uh, office space. This means that you no longer have to worry about hopping from long-term lease to long-term lease when you're growing from five people to 50 people to 5,000 people. Uh, that component that every new company used to have to figure out for themselves, used to have to derive from first principles, those, those, those pieces of making a business run smoothly, of de-risking the various things that you're going to have to do in order to be successful, those pieces are getting uh, templated are starting to turn into best practices. People, the people are making sure that people understand what worked over here can work over there. What did work over here? I'm going to share it. You should just work on what makes your business special, on what makes your business unique. And uh, and uh, so why is it that we can't continue to be effective in removing those barriers and making people? Uh, have the best possible probability of success. So, um, so I, I mentioned, so I run an incubator. I run an inc uh, internet incubator. And um, 
And 80% of our companies succeed. And it's because we pay a lot of attention to the problem. So some of what we do is unique to our sector, and it won't work everywhere. A lot of what we do is generalizable. And I think there is a big opportunity for us to, uh, for us to identify common themes and make it possible for somebody who is going after a big problem to maximize their chance of success and maximize their chance of solving that problem and of making society as a whole function better. So a couple of things that we do. We, because we're on the consumer internet, we start with the data. We can see in our data who is looking for what on the internet, how much they want it, are they finding it, if we were to build something else, would they value it? It's that simple. Who wants what? Can we give it to them? If we, if we can, we can solve their problem and we potentially have a company. We have 130 business plans that has popped out of the data that are IPO scale if we can actually staff them. And this is not theoretical. We've done it 20 times so far and 80% ha have exited or are on track to IPO scale. The thing that we do besides helping entrepreneurs find and go after the right problem is we make sure that we are giving them everything else that they need to succeed. Everything that another company, whether it's a company that we started back in our earlier careers, whether it's a company that one of their advisors has, has interacted with before, whether it's something that one of their brethren in the incubator has gone through, we document it, we make sure that it gets captured in a playbook so that the next person to go through can learn from what they went through and follow the same template. Um, because we're consumer internet, some of those things are unique to our sector. Things like how to effectively define what you're looking for in a VP of engineering candidate is different there than it might be elsewhere. Things like when to turn on real-time display bidding uh, and which exchanges to use, those things are unique to the internet. But things that aren't unique to the internet are things like how do you uh, incorporate with causing yourself tax problems uh, down the road? How do you perform an effective reference check when you're bringing on a key hire? Those things are common not just across internet companies, but across all companies. And those are the kinds of things that uniquely now we can all learn from each other's mistakes, we can all take and, and, uh, and grow from each other's smart ideas. So, um, so back to the Destructinator, because I promised. Um, there is a mythic figure in the American psyche, which is the lone entrepreneur who sits in a perfect room and thinks perfect thoughts and, and <laughs> creates perfect products, and they probably make that product in their garage, um, and then they go door to door, and they knock, and they sell some, and then, you know, they hire somebody to help them make more of those widgets and, you know, faster or better. Um, and then they hire someone else to go to the next town and hire, you know, and uh, sell widgets over there. And you fast forward a few years, and the person is a billionaire. And that's, um, that's, that's a mythic figure. But it's not how entrepreneurship works. You don't have a perfect concept if you, don't, if you can't get feedback from your market and, and respond to it. So, um, so the Destructinator, objectively amazing. I, you know, she said, not biased at all, uh, but objectively amazing. There's a reason why I say it's the best thing I've done and not the best company I've done and not even a company at all. If I had gone the, you know, the mythic billionaire route and pounded the pavements, I'm sure I could have found somebody somewhere on Beacon Street with like truly disposable income who might have bought one or two. But that's, that's not actually solving anyone's problem except for my problem, which was that I was bored and it was a Sunday. And I think this... Uh, this reluctance to decouple the best idea you've ever had and the best thing you can be working on is standing in the way of our, of our uh, efficiency at tackling society's biggest problems, at actually going after the, the biggest opportunities that, that we can and, and growing our economy and, uh, and growing, uh, growing what, we're, uh, what we're able to do in terms of job creation and societal benefit. The methodical, thoughtful, rationalized attack of going through everything that's going on, identifying the biggest problems, and going after it, no matter what the solution is, even if it's not beautiful, even if it has nothing to do with your original idea. 
that's the future of entrepreneurship and that's the future of work. So uh, in closing, I'll just say, if you are one of those people, one of those half of all people who want to take a risk, who want to start a company, who don't want to work for somebody else, I would say go for it. The infrastructure is there. Your chances have never been higher. But make sure that you're going after the right problem. Thank you.